All right, take your Bible this evening if you would. You got me going there? Do I have it on? Yep. All right, take your Bible this evening to Proverbs 3, please. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse number 1, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and morrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the firstfruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor." Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop down dew. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening, and Lord, we bow before you as we open up your word now to study it together, and I pray, God, you would help us this evening and give us understanding as we look into your word. We see some principles, uh, glean some truths here from the third chapter of Proverbs that will help us to be better servants of yours in the coming year. So, Lord, guide us and lead us as we study your word this evening, and I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm talking to you tonight about some resolutions from Proverbs. You know, if you think back, you might about this time last year, might have been thinking about this is a year. Things are going to be different. Uh, We're going to make some changes. And uh, I won't ask you how that's gone for you. I know that most people, some people, in fact, I heard somebody just just the other day say, I don't make any resolutions anymore because by February I don't keep them. And, uh, and if they make it till February, sometimes they're doing pretty good. Uh, but I know this, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Uh, you're still better off to set some goals. You're still better off to make some resolutions. The wisest man, one of the wisest men, if not the wisest man that lived, was a man named Solomon. Because God gave him wisdom. And he gives us some principles here, some, you could call them resolutions, uh, for uh, a new year are resolutions that we could live by. And I think that every one of us at the end of a year ought to take some inventory about what, where we are in our life, what is, how, we're, how we're doing from the last year, and what are some goals we'd like to set for the next year. Uh, you know, you, if you don't do anything then you won't do anything. If you don't set anything to aim at, you won't hit anything. And you, in fact, you know, you never stay still in the Christian life. Do you understand that? You you, you say, well, I'll just be on hold for a while. You don't want to be on hold in the Christian life. You will either go forward or you go backward. There's no no standing still. There's no staying in one spot. It's uh, You have to be pressing on the upward way New heights I'm gaining every day are you slowly begin to slide back down. And that's why the Bible calls it back sliding. Okay? You begin to go backwards. So I when you talk about resolutions, I I read recently the 
five most popular resolutions for a new year. Number five was take up a new hobby. Number four was to make more money. Number three was to improve relationships. Number two was to stop smoking. And number one, you know what the number one resolution is for most people? Anybody want to guess? Lose weight. Lose weight. A woman walked into her bathroom at home, and as she did, she saw her husband weighing, her, weighing himself. And as he was weighing himself, she saw him s sucking in his stomach. And she thought to herself, he thinks he's going to weigh less because he's sucking in his stomach. And so she said quite sarcastically to her husband, like, that's going to help. He says, it will help. I can see the numbers. <laughs> Maybe that's where you are. I don't know. But uh, after, after what I ate over Christmas, I'm going to need that, I think. But, you know, we all, you know, here this last Wednesday of 2017, we ought, to, we ought to think about some goals you'd want to set for yourself, resolutions, if you will, uh, something you would aim at and shoot for to become a better Christian and a better follower of Jesus Christ in 2018. Uh, than you were in 2017. You know, most someone said most of the resolutions that people make fall under three categories. They they fall under longevity, prosperity, or peace. That's generally where you can fit every resolution that people make into one of those three categories. But but I think we're not to conform to the world. So I think our resolutions should not just fit under longevity or prosperity or peace, but they ought to fit under some biblical resolutions. What, is, what, what are some things biblically that I should do? What is, does God have any recommendations for me? Well, I think the wisest man who ever lived does. And that's where Proverbs 3 comes in. I think these are New Year's resolutions from Solomon, from Proverbs chapter 3. And I want you to consider them tonight. You may not adopt all seven of them, but you may the Lord may strike a chord in your heart, and you may say, you know what, I think I need to do this. But if they were good enough for Solomon, maybe they'd be good enough for you and me. All right? Let's see what they are. Number one is keep a balance between mercy and truth. Verse number three. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Mercy and truth. Those two qualities, those two characteristics need to be the guiding lights in our lives. Don't let mercy and truth forsake you. Foundational to everything you do has to be that balance between mercy and truth. Now, mercy is sensitivity. It's being sensitive to people who suffer. And whether it's physical or mentally or spiritually, whatever way they're suffering, you're sensitive to that and you have sympathy with what they're going through in fact, mercy is this. Mercy is not giving somebody what they deserve. That's mercy. God was merciful to us in not sending us to hell. He didn't give us what we deserve. Okay, and all of us deserve that. We deserve the judgment of God. But God was merciful and didn't give that to us. But then there's truth. Truth is interesting. Truth is conformity to fact or reality. It's exact accordance to that which has been and is and shall be. What does that sound like? What has been, what is, and what shall be. That's God. The same yesterday, today, and forever. But God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. Pure from falsehood. It's interesting how many times in the Bible, and, and I think I listed the verses there for you, where mercy and truth are listed together and are mentioned together. Psalm 25.10, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep His covenant and His testimonies. Psalm 61, verse 7, He shall abide before God forever, O prepare mercy and truth which may preserve Him. And on and on, mercy and truth, on the 85.10, mercy and truth are met together. Righteous and peace have kissed each other. 
Psalm 86.15 But Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. Amazing how many times those two are put together, mercy and truth. You know, we, we have to always maintain mercy, but you also have to maintain truth. Truth is very critical of mercy. Truth says, mercy, you're weak. Mercy, you don't understand. If everything's left to you, mercy, the world's going to fall apart. On the other hand, mercy says, but without me, truth, you'll drive people away. You're harsh. You're rough. The truth is, most of us let one or the other depart. Most of us, we're either truth or we're mercy. The struggle is having the right balance of being both truthful and merciful at the same time. Generally, the one that departs is the one we're weaker in. We go to the one that we feel more comfortable with. Notice what he said. You're going to bind them, verse 3, Bind them, bind what? Mercy and truth about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. You have to make that commitment to being merciful and truthful. It's outwardly, it says, as they bind them about your neck, like you'd wear a, a necklace or something hanging around your neck. That's outward. But then he says, write it on the table of your heart. That's inward. It's not just something for show. It's something you're asking God to put in your heart. You and I can't do anything with your heart, and I can't write anything on my heart, but God can. And so I'm going to pray and ask God to put it on my heart, mercy and truth. They're vitally important. An outward adorning and an inward adorning. The outward and the inward relationships. That's a balance in the Christian life that only God can help you to maintain. All of us have been in those situations where a situation comes up or somebody's done something and boy, one person, oh, bless God, this is what they need to do. Yes, da, 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 da. And someone else says, oh man, I don't, I don't think we'll be that rough. I think, I think this is something we could do. And so says, oh, you're too soft. And the other one says, oh, you're too hard. What is it? Mercy and truth. Mercy and truth. And you need... The truth is, you don't need all mercy and no truth. You don't need all truth and no mercy. You need mercy and truth. You need that combination. You need both of them. And only God, I can't put that in me. And you can't put it in you. Only God can etch that in our soul. God is the one who has the mercy and the truth. God is truth and His mercy endureth forever. His mercy is forever lasting. He's got plenty of mercy. He's plenteous in mercy. And so only He can give us that balance that we need in our relationships. All right? Mercy and truth. Resolution number two. Verses five and six. Trust in the Lord with all my heart. So, ah, preacher, that's easy. I got that one done. Uh, let's see. Trust. What sort of trust mean? Trust means a firm belief, a firm belief in or a confidence in the honesty, integrity, reliability, and justice of another person or thing. In other words, I'm, it, it's my faith and my confidence in the person or thing that I'm looking to. I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart, with all my being, with everything that I have. How do I do that? In all thy ways, what? Acknowledge Him, and He shall direct my path. I show that I'm trusting in God with all my heart if I acknowledge Him in all my ways. And we don't get, don't get all upset over things that happen. Because, well, why did this happen? How come this took place? What, what happened? God, why is this? We get all upset. Well, they said they were coming. Now they're not coming. That just messes everything up. You see? Boy, are we, is that showing our trust in God? Who's in control? All of a sudden, we get all upset. We're supposed to believe all things work together for good, but we sure do get upset about all things real quick. 
and get upset and think, oh, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Do I trust the Lord with all my heart when in all my ways I acknowledge Him? Acknowledge means I admit to be true or as stated. I'm going to recognize the authority or the claims of someone. Recognize an answer. So I'm recognizing the authority of God in my life. That He's in control. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. And He shall direct thy paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I know that's a verse you, you know and we memorize it and everybody says, oh yeah, I got that one. We, we, I'm afraid we know it up here, but we've got to pull it down to our heart and say, do I really, do I really live this way? Is this really the, what, what I'm going to do? Can I do that in 2018? Can I really trust in the Lord with all my heart? Can I, can I, can I all my ways acknowledge Him when it's, when it's my 11-year-old daughter in the hospital with 105 fever? And they got a blood clot and pneumonia. And, hmm? When it's my little girl that's facing an open-heart surgery? Hmm? When it's when it's my car that just got demolished. <laughs> and I told Brother Moreland, he said, well, you lost a trailer this year and you lost a car this year. and Why don't you just lock yourself in your house and stay there till next year? All right? <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart, right? Yeah. But is, is God in control? Do I in all my ways acknowledge Him or do I not? So we trust the Lord with all our heart. The way I show my trust is to acknowledge Him in all my ways. And then He'll direct my path. All right? So I'm going to have uh, mercy and truth. I want to make sure that I uh, uh, have those uh, a balance between mercy and truth. I want to make sure that I'm trusting the Lord with all my heart. Number three, here's an, uh, his is a good one. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Verse 7, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and morrow to thy bones. You know you're going to be healthier if you don't think you're so smart? Don't think you know it all? Yes, don't just... Don't just decide what you think is best. That's how we think we're wise in our own eyes. When we, when we don't take time to pray and talk to God about decisions and talk to God about things that need to be done, we just make the decision. We think we're pretty smart. When your children get to be, these look like teenagers. Are they teenagers? Yeah. Dad says, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they will make decisions sometimes. And as teenagers do sometimes, they make decisions, and you look at them and say, what were you thinking? And what you really would like to say is, why didn't you come ask for some help? Why didn't you come and ask? You know why? Because they think they knew best. And I did the same thing when I was a teenager. Okay? I just think I knew better. Why do we go ahead and make decisions without consulting God or consulting His Word? Because we think we know better. Boy, that's quiet. Be not wise in thine own eyes. And that's what happens. We think we know better than God. Well, well, I know the Bible says that, but. And then we proceed to say why we think it's okay. Several things, how not to think of yourself. New Testament says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Okay? Here's how you don't do that. It means when you are not going to be wise in your own eyes, you're going to gladly admit that all true wisdom is from God. All true wisdom is from God. Number two, means you recognize that any sense of superiority that you have comes from comparing yourself to others. 
who oftentimes you compare yourself to people who are inferior to you. That's why you think you're pretty, you're pretty something. The truth is, compare yourself to God. Compare yourself to Jesus Christ. And then let me know how good you're doing. Let me know how wise you are. How smart you're doing. Number three, it, it means that you will feel humbled by the fact you're a sinner deserving God's wrath and you're amazed at His grace that gave you the gift of eternal life. That, that humility and amazement at the grace of God, you know what that does? That swallows up your pride. When you remember that I'm a sinner saved by grace, you know, Jeanette says it when she gives her testimony. She always says, I just want to thank the Lord for saving my wretched soul. And sometimes you get used to hearing that and you don't, you know, you just think, oh, that's just something she says. No, I think that's, that's the way she tries to keep herself from getting proud. You know what? I still got, it's been safe, been safe 30 years. But you know what? I still, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a, wretch like me don't 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 forget that number four it means that you don't count yourself worthy of being served but rather you want to serve others jesus said i didn't come to be ministered unto but to minister i didn't come for people to serve me i came to serve others one way to keep from serving, to keep from getting, thinking yourself more highly than you ought to think is serve other people. Be a servant. Look for things to do. Look for ways to serve. In marriage counseling, we talk about the main purpose of your marriage is ministry. Before all those details in Ephesians 5 about the husband and the wife, you know what it is? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Serving each other. If you will continue to always look at your mate saying, how can I serve them? You'll have a great relationship. You'll have a great marriage. You know when you get in trouble? I don't do anything for me. When's the last time you did something for me? And we start thinking about how we're being served. And what we're doing. Same thing's true in your Christian life. Okay? And you get to thinking that you deserve things. Okay? So serve. And then number five, or number, let's see, do I have four? Yeah, no. D, one, A, B, C, D, E. It means you're mainly not thinking about yourself at all. But you are thinking about Jesus Christ, how admirable He is, and about His works. In other words, my, my focus is not on me. My focus is supposed to be on Jesus Christ. As we run the race, we're looking unto Jesus. How easy is it to start looking at other Christians and then look at ourselves? And we look at the circumstances. We look at everything else and we quit our eyes off looking at Jesus. Keeping our eyes on who we're supposed to look at. But don't think about yourself. That's where most of our problems come into. Is we get self-centered. Even Christians. And then we get to thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. So don't, don't be wise in your own eyes. Could you, could you always remember there's that there's that tiny, minuscule, wee bit possibility you could be wrong. Okay? Always allow for that. Okay? And, and don't, don't be wise in your own eyes. Okay? Let's go to the next one. I can see you enjoy that one too much. <laughs> mercy and truth. I'm going to balance between mercy and truth. Trust the Lord with all my heart. Number three, I'm not going to be wise in my own eyes. Number four... I'm going to honor God with my wealth. 
Oh, I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't have to listen to this one. <laughs> don't have any wealth to honor with here. Well, wait a minute now. Verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. That, that starts with tithing. Honoring the Lord with your substance. It starts with giving the Lord what belongs to Him. All right? It's interesting. When the children of Israel were captive in Egypt and God sent Moses back with Aaron to deliver them. If you remember reading that, there began to, uh, Pharaoh began to sort of after some of the plagues, he'd have a, uh, soften his heart a little bit and he'd, he'd say, okay, you can go. But, only some of you go. Or don't take any of your animals with you. In fact, uh, look at Exodus chapter 10. Would you look there? Just put your finger here in Proverbs 3. We're going to come back to that. Look at Exodus 10 with me. Second book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 10. Exodus 10. Notice what Pharaoh says here in verse 24. Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Alright, go, serve the Lord. Hey, that sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, but wait, there's a condition. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. And let your little ones also go with you. Okay, your families can go, but the flocks and the herds, they stay here. Now why... Why would the flocks and the herds be important? That's what they sacrificed to God with. That's the honoring the Lord with their substance. See? And, and he's saying, you can go, but, but not, not to... And that's why Moses said in verse 25, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burn offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not a hoof be left behind. For thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God, and we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. Oh, so we're not going without an opportunity to take our substance with us. There's people today that try to serve God without their substance. And God brought the... Um, in Exodus chapter 12, go over a couple chapters. This is after the death of the firstborn. The Bible says in verse number 35, the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, Exodus 12 verse 35, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required. Notice the last sentence. And they spoiled the Egyptians. But if you remember, so they leave. They leave with all kinds of gold and silver and jewels and precious things. But if you fast forward into, uh, in fact, let me think. Um, Exodus 25. Exodus 25, I believe. Yeah. Here they're bringing an offering to build the tabernacle. Notice what the Lord said. The Lord spake unto Moses, verse 1, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. This is the offering which ye shall take of them. Gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, remember, 
What were the Israelites in Egypt? Somebody said it. They were slaves. Where are they getting gold and silver and onyx stones and all this material badger skin and this dyed red and this? Where did they get all that? They got it from the Egyptians when they spoiled the Egyptians. What did they get all that for? For them to enjoy it? No. So they could honor the Lord with their substance. Why did God give you what He's given you? So you could honor the Lord with your substance. With the first fruits of all your increase. Will you honor the Lord in 2018? God, God wanted them to worship Him with their substance. And I would contend to you, He hasn't changed. He still wants us to honor Him with our substance. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 7, Paul writing to the church there in Corinth, he told them, Therefore as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in, dilig in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. This is the grace of giving. He said, would you abound in the ability to give of your substance? He talks about the churches of Macedonia, how they gave, even though they were in deep poverty, they gave under the riches of their liberality. They still honored the Lord with their substance. We are blessed beyond measure in America. I had to rebuke one guy who I, I've known for years. He's in a different state. On Facebook, he put a quote up of, of, of an actress, Hollywood actress, criticizing the wealthy. I looked this woman up. She's worth $100 million. And she's basically saying we have poor people because the wealthy people hoard all the wealth. And he thought that was a good quote. I said, <laughs> you, you, got, you got real problems here. I said, and the truth is, to 95% of the world, you're wealthy. Oh, I know, we look around the room, we say, nobody wealthy here. No, but let me, let me bring in some of the Filipinos we were with. Bring in some of the pastors from India. And you would say, these folks are wealthy. Okay? Do you honor the Lord with your substance? The promise, the promise is in, 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 in 2 Corinthians. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Notice what God says in verse number 6. This I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. God said, I want you to do this willingly. And by the way, notice that's what God said back in Exodus 2. He said, I want you to do it willingly. I want you to give it willingly to the Lord. And honor me with your substance. And God says, when you do that, He says, you do it bountifully, I'll see to it you reap bountifully. Notice what his promise is. He said in verse number 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. All grace, all sufficiency, all things, abounding in every good work, if you honor the Lord with your substance. If you put God first. what says in Proverbs he said that your barns will be filled with plenty and your presses will burst out with new wine God God will honor those who honor him you won't go without if you're trusting God so I'm going to balance mercy and truth I'm going to trust the Lord with all my heart not to be wise in my own eyes honor God with my wealth resolution number five Verses 11 and 12. I will welcome the Lord's discipline. I will welcome the Lord's discipline. Oh boy. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of His correction. For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth, even as a father, the son, 
in whom he delighteth. Let me ask you a question. Will you make the changes God prompts you to make in 2018? Or will you say, hey, this is the way I am. You don't like it? Lump it. Or when God speaks to you about changing something, will you change it? You know, if the Bible says that we're not to despise the chasing of the Lord, I guess we could come to despise it. If it says don't be weary of His correction, I guess we could get weary of His correction. But the truth is, whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth. Why do... Hey, parents, why do you correct your children? It ought to be because you love them. It should be because you... you uh, oh, who are we talking to? Ah, I lost it. Must not be what the Lord wanted me to say. But um, about, about correcting our children. The truth is, the Bible says a child left in himself is going to bring his mother to shame. You want to, you want to be ashamed one of your children? Just let them do what they want. You, when, when you discipline them, and listen, they may not like it, and they may look obstinate on the outside, but I'll guarantee you on the inside they know somebody cares. You're growing up, and I'm growing up, and my dad would always want to know, who, where, you know where you're going, who you're with, what, what's, who's going to be there, what's going to... Man, wanting all this stuff, and I think, man, all these other kids are out there, they don't have parents like that. You know what I come to find out? They wish they did. Awful lonely feeling being out there at night, realizing nobody cares whether where I am. Nobody cares whether I come home or not. Nobody cares when I come home. It's a pretty, pretty lonely feeling. It's kind of nice to know somebody cares where you are, cares what you're doing, is concerned enough for you. And when you're wrong, is going to correct you. The Lord, the Bible says here, whom the Lord loves, He corrects. So when God corrects you, it's to let you know He loves you. In fact, Hebrews tells us He corrects every, chastens every son whom He receives. There's nobody here that hasn't been chastened by God if you're a child of God. He's corrected every one of us. Will you welcome His correction in 2018? When, when the Spirit of God puts His finger on something in your life, will you respond to it? You see, we, want to, we correct our children because we want them to grow up to be a responsible adult. We want them to grow up to be a, I hope as a Christian, you want them to grow up to be a person that will honor God with their life and want to obey God. If, listen, if a child never learns to obey mom and dad, they're not going to obey God. They have to learn to obey mom. No, no child is right with God and wrong with their mom and dad. They're your authority in your home. And if you want to be right with God, you have to be right with mom and dad. And so you, you, you do that and parents will discipline them because they love them and they want them to turn out for the Lord and to do right in their life. But the Lord has a different goal for our discipline. He's, he disciplines us to help mature us for our maturity. Paul said, I want to present every man mature in Christ Jesus, complete in Christ Jesus. What is the Lord trying to do in each one of our lives? Conform us to who? The image of Jesus Christ. So everything that He does for us is designed to make us more like Christ. I don't know about you, but He's got a lot of work to do on me to get me there. A lot of correction. And I have to not get weary of that correction. Not think that I've got it. it it's, here we go again. God, God doesn't delight in chastening His children just like no parent delights 
in Chase and Perry. And I used to, I, I, I know, when I was a kid, and my dad would say, now this hurts me more than it hurts you. I didn't believe him until I became a dad. I never, I never one time, I don't ever remember one time enjoying giving my, any of my children a spanking. I, I, I got to where I just dreaded it. I, but, but I had to do it. But I don't enjoy it. Neither does God. But He has to do it. To get us to be like Christ and to conform us to the image of His Son. He's not out to get you. Boy, I just cringe when I hear people say, well, maybe God's just got it out for me. Where'd that come from? What, what parent who loves their child would have it out for them? Now, if we, if we wouldn't do that for our children whom we love, would God do that with His children? No. You, you got the wrong concept of God. The wrong idea of God. When He chases us, it's proof positive that He loves us. He's not allowing us to just go off on our own and cause great shame to Him in the meantime. Well, let's go to resolution number 6. Verses 13 through 24. I won't read all of this. We'll just kind of touch on it. Um, Where your time here tonight. I will seek diligently for wisdom. Will you make that a priority in 2018 that you'll seek diligently for wisdom? You have to find it. Happy is the man, verse 13, that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Wisdom has two groups of characteristics. It's information and it's know-how. Take a farmer with a tractor in a field. He has to have the right equipment and the materials and the gasoline, but he still has to know what to do with it and what not to do with it. How to use it and how not to use it. When to use it, when not to use it. Where to use it and where not to use it if you're going to be a successful farmer. I've never been a farmer. You could, you could take me out to the fields and say, there's your tractor, there's all the fuel you need, and uh, here's the different things to hook up to the tractor. Uh, we'll see you in a year and see how you do. I wouldn't know the first thing, when to plow, when not to plow, what to hook up, what not to hook up. I don't know anything about that. You understand? It's information, but it's also know-how. Well, verses 13 through 20 talks about the characteristics of wisdom that deal with knowledge and learning and information and intelligence and data and facts and intelligence and experience. When you get to verses 21, 22, 23, and 24... It, you see the characteristics of wisdom that has to do with perception and discernment and judgment and reason and insight and prudence and discretion. Common sense, if you will. Just plain old common sense. Wisdom. Ezra, when they saw Ezra with the Bible, they said, Ezra, according to the wisdom of God that's in your hand. You get wisdom... By being around wise people. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Why don't you spend time with some wise people? Read the Bible every day. You get to be around some pretty wise people. And what he that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Okay? You get wisdom by praying and asking God for it. And God gives you wisdom as you seek for it and you seek to find it. Be diligent about it. There's some great characteristics there of wisdom that you get as you read through that passage. Let me give you resolution number seven. Resolution number seven. I will not withhold good from my neighbor. You ever heard... You ever, you ever said to somebody or had somebody say to you, now if you need anything, don't hesitate to call me. Anybody ever heard that? Anybody ever said that? Okay. How many people ever got called? Hey, you said if you ever need anything, not hesitate to call you. So I'm calling you on that. 
Occasionally, could happen. God's way is always a giving way. God's way is always a giving way. What did Jesus say? He said, and, and Paul quoted in Acts 20, verse number 35, Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, it's interesting. In verse number 27, notice it says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. In other words, and some people think, well, that's withhold not good to people who deserve it. I don't think we're looking at who deserves it and who doesn't. That's not our area to determine. Well, when we say, don't withhold good from whom it is due, when it's in the power of thy hand to do it, well, who wonder who he's talking about? Well, keep reading. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So keep reading. Say not unto who? Thy neighbor. Go and come again, and tomorrow I'll give it thee when thou hast it by thee. So, who's the one I'm withholding good from? My neighbor. What did the parable of the Good Samaritan Jesus teach? Who's, who, who's my neighbor? Anybody in need is my neighbor. And so, I'm not to withhold good from my neighbor, from those who need it. My, my focus is not to be on convenience in other words, I'm telling them to come back another day because it's not convenient for me right now. Have you noticed it's never convenient to help somebody else? You're, when, when you're in a hurry and you've got to be somewhere, that's when you'll see somebody broken down beside the road and the God will say, help that guy, will you? You'll say, huh? Lord, how do I have time to do this? It's always that way. When you're just out driving and you're not really, you're just kind of no, no schedule, you know what? You won't see anybody needs help. Just the way it works. It's never convenient. And you're not, listen, and don't look at somebody and say, well, I'm just going to make them wait a day. It'll, do, it'll teach them some patience. That's not your department either. Okay? Not focusing on that. I'm focusing on compassion and a desire to help somebody else. I have it. I'm not going to say, hey, be ye warmed and filled. And then walk away. Again, go back to who's in, who's in charge. Who's in control of my life? Who's directing my path? Because I'm acknowledging Him. So if He's directing my path, and He had that person cross my path, Bob Myers sits down there. You know why? Because he needed help one day at Walmart. Some guy named Bob Wallace was walking by. What a coincidence. No. He directed his path. See? And now, here's Bob Myers, member of the church, serving God. He had no idea. He didn't say, I think I'll go to Walmart today. Maybe I'll run into a Christian who will witness to me and then I'll end up going to church and I'll get baptized and then I'll be... He didn't think anything like that. See? That's God. But he didn't withhold good from someone we had an opportunity to do it for him. That's what he's talking about. Let's do good unto all men, Galatians 6.10, but especially those who are of the household of faith. Will you determine that you're going to do good? You'll not withhold good from people who you could do good for? Well, maybe you won't do all seven. But you ought to consider some of them. You ought to consider it. They're steep. They're pretty rough. But I think there's some others. You could probably read through Proverbs 3 and come up with some of your own that the Lord may speak to you and give, give to you. But let's... I, I would encourage you to aim at something. I encourage you to, to, to pray and as you read, and you read through the Proverbs particularly... Ask God to give you some things that you could write down and say, you know what, this is, this is what I think God would have me do. You'll be, you, if, you don't do if you don't aim to do something, you're not going to 
be any better this time next year than you are right now. In fact, you probably will be a little bit worse. You won't be any better. God may, may help us to line our will up with His will and be what He wants us to be in the coming year. These are seven resolutions from a pretty smart guy. And we do well to take his advice. And maybe some of these would resonate with us to practice in our life. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening now. Thank you for the time to study your word together. Thank you, Lord, for Solomon and for allowing him to pen these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would think carefully about these resolutions that came to Solomon, these principles, really, if you will, principles of life. And Lord, it, it just kind of hits us well this time of year as we kind of look back over the last year and we look ahead to a new year. We, we tend to say, you know, there's some things I'd like to change, some things I'd like to do better. Lord, I pray that we'd carefully think about these resolutions and these principles that Solomon gives us in Proverbs 3 and that you would help each of us to see what you would have us to do in the coming year. Most of all, Lord, continue to work on us and conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. That others would clearly see Jesus in us and that we could point others to Him in 2018. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Make us mindful of your presence as we leave this place. We'll thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, we're going to sing, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. Then choir, we'll have a practice real quick, all right? Here we go, ready? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. God bless you. You're dismissed.